Dave McMillan and Fred Moran, welcome to Q. Thanks for having us, Tom. It's a pleasure Such to have you. Such an honor. It's nice to have you. It's an honor to have you here. So the book is called Joe Beef, Surviving the Apocalypse. Uh, Dave, is the end of the world nigh? <laughs> it's coming. It's here, I think. This might be, uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's pre-apocalypse, but sometimes I feel like uh, some of this book is post-apocalyptic. So I don't know. Have you, given, have you read it? Yeah, I've read it. I feel like uh, I feel like you're discussing the end of the world in a lot of different ways, not necessarily a meteor or zombies coming our way. For sure, it's tongue in cheek. Yeah, uh, you know, running a restaurant's already difficult. I think running a restaurant in uh, a very old neighborhood and crumbling buildings. I think all the restaurants that we own are in very decrepit old buildings. Uh, so you know, we have to be survivalist almost as on top of running the restaurants. You know, fra- Fred practices amateur plumbing. Um, artisanal electricity, artisanal refrigeration repair, mm. uh, you know, to be a restaurateur in this day and age in these small restaurants that we run, uh, we have to be prepared for anything. I mean, well, Fred, is that, are you becoming one of those guys who's stocking ammo at the bottom of the driveway? Or anything oh, yeah, like man, that? I have so many cans of chickpeas in the basement. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a thin line to uh, to be on, eh? The survivalist prepping line. It's a weird little world because, yeah. you know, on one side of things, you're just kind of making, you know, taking side of uh, any possibility. And the other side, you're like, But no. you know what? You can stock as, many, um, as much food as you want or as much seeds or ammo, but if you can't cook it, if you can't garden, mm-hmm. that's what the book's about, right? It's like... You Surviving have to cook. the apocalypse in style. Yeah, you have to cook those chickpeas you store. You know, you have to make soap with the leftover fat from your wild boar hunt. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I was, I was, I was surprised to see a soap recipe in this book. Yeah, and I said it before too. And you're, uh, this is a small, a big studio, but uh, a bunker is about the tenth of that size. And you can imagine after a few weeks of uh, trying to avoid the radiation, what the smell would be in there. And if you have soap, you're safe. The 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 premise of the book that I really like is that just because it's the end of the world doesn't mean you. You, you only have to eat beans. You only have to eat, you know, you can, you can eat well and still face off the zombies. Oh, you have to. Like if, <laughs> if, if, if you want to go, you want to go in style. You want to go in with lavish dinners. So I, I want to talk about this. The book has some, and I said, this is kind of the premise of the book, but the book's about a lot more than that. And as I mentioned, the book doesn't have recipes for how to heat up a can of Heinz baked beans. I mean, there's uh, homemade sauces, bouillon cubes where you need a hashish press. And this is not your great aunt's copy of The Joy of Cooking or anything like that. So in, in all seriousness, who, who is this book for? Is it a cookbook for home cooks? Or is it a demonstration of what goes into the work that you guys do? Somewhat of a demonstration of uh, the work that we do, but also like the story of two guys that used to live a street away from each other as bachelors in their tiny apartments that worked 80 to 100 hours a week for many, many years. Two guys that thought that they'd never have girlfriends, let alone wives. Right. Two guys that thought they'd never have kids that have three apiece. Mm-hmm. Uh, Two guys that thought that they'd only have one restaurant with you know maybe four or five employees. Now we have one hundred employees and six restaurants. Uh, there's a certain feeling of uneasiness of stewardship that we have at maintaining the company healthfully. The people that work there are not only our friends, they're people that we love. We work with them a lot of hours per week. So we have families and these children that are thrust upon us that we worry about, that we want to save from all of the terrible things that we've gone through, all these employees that we work with on a daily basis, that we want them to not go through the same kind of horrible apprenticeship or go through all the the pitfalls that we did in our careers to get where well, we working are. Working in bad kitchens, working in bad situations. Yeah, but those kids are much too smart. They're like <laughs> that generation that we call millennials are much, 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 much smarter than we are. You know, we looked at where we were in that time where we had like uh, almost communicating apartment. We were dumb, you know? Yeah. We'd like we'd go to a restaurant and order like Cabernet from California or just drink beers. And those, those kids, same age, 
they drink natural wine, they know they get, they go to the market, they buy pig ears, they make recipes, they buy the cookbooks, they listen to your show, they buy concert tickets, they mm -hmm. pay for music, they yeah. pay. They're It's not like marketed brilliant. too easily, the, the new generation. That's the one thing that I notice very much is you can't fool them. Right. Fancy marketing is not going to get them to buy the the beer with that a, a lot of money is getting put behind. You mm -hmm. know, they want to drink craft beer mm -hmm. made locally. They want to drink natural wine made locally. They want they to make eat farm beer. They cheese. Make wine. Well, they, and they want to eat sweetbreads. They want to eat want parts to eat, of the beef, yeah. uh, parts of the pig. The parts they of want the to cow. wear quality goods. Yeah. They don't want to be. You, you're, you're, they have, people are having big difficulty marketing to this generation. But, but back to what we were talking about before. When it comes to like, are, are you often lamenting? home cooking these days? I mean, it feels like there's oh, a time, think, we're in the time of Uber Eats, we're in the time of people you can getting find everything delivered. everything at the market. I think that um, cooking is a bit like a spectator sport now. It's like football. Everybody knows about football or hockey, right? You know the rules, you know the regulation, you know what trade should have happened, you know how to make a duck breast, you know which recipe, which chef, which restaurant is hot. But do you play hockey? No. Do you cook? No. It's, it's, yeah. it's a thing that people do from, from afar. It's a, it's a remote interest in cooking. Now, cooking also doesn't always mean to open a box and follow the instruction on the, the perfect, uh, you know, mail order food that you get. It also means goes, go to the market. Buy, Isn't that buy. funny? Hey, this whole thing about delivering ingredients of a recipe. Do you, do you know how much, how much like packaging goes into that? You know, yeah. how much like little bottles, little this, little that. But maybe, hey, maybe that segue, maybe that stepping stone into people starting to cook again. Yeah. But uh, which would Anything be Anything awesome. to get the people to cook more. Well, why is, why is that so important? it's a survivalist skill, ultimately. People, we've lost many things. We've lost, people used to be very well-read. They're not so much anymore, I feel. People used to have a wide breadth of musical education so much. Now we just eat what we're given on the radio, we're marketed to. Yeah. People used to cook and be able to even raise a few chickens in the yard and... Now we don't know that, mm -hmm. you know. And when so people when wanted we... a house, they built a house. Yeah. So or... we've lost a lot of skills, really. Now we're just consumers, consumers' restaurants, consumers' clothes, consumers' magazines, but we don't know really how to do much in depth. Well, Maybe yeah, I... change the screen of an iPhone. Yeah, I can. I can do that. I was gonna say. <laughs> yeah, I, I could probably help you with that, but I couldn't, you know, deplumb the the basement or anything like that. But I think I just reading this book made me realize how few things I have. Like I don't have a deep frying thermometer. I'm afraid to fry things in my on my stove because my oh, house is so cheap. You like know? you can get all the, in, or like all, an ice the, bath. I don't have these things. Yeah, know? no, but uh, everything we suggest in there, we can buy, you can buy it for the price of a Bluetooth headset. Right. You right, know, right. like for real, it's just a matter of priority or, um, thermometer is important. A deep fryer is important. Yeah. Like, don't set your house on fire. I just think about, yeah, in Newfoundland, when you go to certain places around, there's this a town called Bay Roberts, and just like on the sign of like, welcome to Bay Roberts, there's a picture of a stove with a pan with like, do not have fat fires, please, whatever you do, because it just, you know, all the houses uh, After up. a certain time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just after two in the morning, maybe don't have fat yeah. fires. But this is also very artful, Dave. This is, this is, this is artful work. These are, these are works of art that you guys have created. We right? have beautiful paintings in here by Peter Hoffer. We mm -hmm. have original Kim Dorland. Uh, paintings. There's some uh, Peter Doig original paintings. Doig being arguably one of the top 10 painters in the world. Mm -hmm. These are all drawings in the book that he did when his studio was above Chez Paré in Montreal. Uh, I'd even say that the, the food itself, the recipes oh, well, themselves. Thank you. Thank well, you. That's fair to say though, right? Yeah. I don't know. Fred and I have never kind of looked at food artfully more as something that's a craft, I think, or... Uh, I Maybe... The minute you repeat it, it's a craft. Ah, uh, yeah. The minute you are required to do it over and over again, and uh, the, the art of the craft, if you want, is to do it better every time you do it. Mm. Um, it's always it's a slippery slope when you start saying that, like, uh, cooks are artists and stuff, and then we are craftsmen because we have to make sure it's clean. Mm-hmm. We, have to we are craftsmen because we have to make sure that people are paid. We are, we're craftsmen because we have to make sure that customers are happy, that they don't get poisoned, that we buy like locally. Like this is not the, the concerns of artists. Mm -hmm. The creativity in what we do is minimal. 
even the act of cooking somewhat is minimal. It's more resourcefulness than creativity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. H- how, to do, how to do the best with what you have. To come up with a dish is 30 seconds of uh, mental labor, mm-hmm. but to actually just make sure that the alley behind the restaurants is spotless and the garbage is taken out every day requires mm-hmm. lots of work and lots of communication. The, just the dining room, the wine sales, just sourcing product requires so much time that the actual creative endeavor of deciding what to do with rabbit, mushrooms, and carrots is quickly done. See, that's, yeah, that's the part that seems very mysterious to me as I go home and stare at chickpeas and ground beef. And I'm thinking about this tonight. I have ground beef in my freezer and a can of chickpeas in my cupboard, and I'm going, what in the name of God am I going to do with that tonight? A reservation somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I we like need a- people like you to support the industry. Yeah, see, thank God for people like me, hey? Thank God for people yes. like me going to these restaurants. The, uh, well, I love how you say that this is also the story of you two guys in Montreal, you two guys starting these restaurants in Montreal and how you had four or five employees when you first when you began now you have a big team of employees three restaurants and you have world leaders dining at your establishment. Of course, Joe Beef and Liverpool House Next Door got a lot of attention in the media when uh, Barack Obama, U.S. President Barack Obama, former U.S. President Barack Obama, and current Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, another Montreal native, uh, got together and had dinner at your place. Dave, what was that like? That was neat. Uh, You know, we've had a long relationship with Justin over the years, well before he even, you know, was talking about Becoming prime minister, you know, we sounds been... like you can't believe it either. <laughs> no, no, it, it was all, it was a it, it was a shock to everybody. I think early on when the, when the, when the murmurs started, but no, Fred and I used to cook for Justin uh, all the way back, even at Globe Restaurant, a restaurant we worked at, you know, maybe twenty years ago. And as we grow up, as we become, you know, forty something men, uh, so did Justin. So we've known him for over twenty twenty something years. We've had lots of fun at the bar. We've shared drinks, like I've shared drinks with you. And, mm-hmm. Uh, now he's the prime minister and he's always had, like, I can't get Justin to eat a Joe B for some weird reason. He decided that the restaurant that we own that he likes is Liverpool House. Right. And that particular table in the corner, way before he was prime minister, he used to eat there with his wife and that's... It's that's um, when restaurant Obama... of the people. It's a more accessible restaurant in a way, you know? It's... Is, is that stressful for you guys to have the prime minister and the president? Maybe that's a bit of a silly question. Justin, no problem. Uh, it feels fine. And, uh, you know, the detail, security detail is uh, we can deal with it. It's just a couple of escalades. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> a couple of snipers. A couple, yeah. <laughs> Whereas uh, Obama, they were scoping the street out for five days. We had snipers on the theater across oh, the street. God, yeah. We had like, literally a SWAT team behind the restaurant, another one down the street. The cement barriered off the street, and uh, it was quite something. I'd say, by some counts, there must have, there could have been you know two, three thousand people across the street at the Corona Theater. Uh, inside the restaurant, though, was contained uh, chaos, mm-hmm. and they had a very nice, friendly dinner. And uh, he gave uh, time. He spoke to the staff, took pictures with the kids in the kitchen, uh, spent fifteen minutes with my daughter Dylan, just talking about mathematics and high school. Well, what do you mean? He said, who's this young lady? And I go, that's my daughter. He goes, oh, bring her over here. The, Barack Obama said yeah. that. Yeah. And I bring her over there. And he goes, Dylan, sit down. And he sat there, laid back, and legs crossed, and uh, sipped on his wine as he, you know, finished dessert and talked with her for, you know, what, what felt for me like an eternity, five minutes, and then they went on to 10 minutes. And I kind of went to the table and said, should I pull her? And he was like, no, I'd rather... I'd rather talk to your daughter than most of those people standing at the bar that seem to want to talk to me. And I said, that's funny. That's great, though. That's yeah, something was, that she'll remember for the rest of her life. Yeah, and they actually, uh, the, the photographer, the official photographer for the for the parliament sent uh, the pictures to us. And so Dylan, in her bedroom, has this beautiful picture of her, Justin, and Barack, and mm-hmm. uh, quite the star at mm-hmm. high school the next day. You know, pretty cool, very cool. I, I'm also aware, and like, guys, we, we all have similar friends within the restaurant industry. I have a lot of buddies back in Newfoundland who you know. and I've been We lucky, love those guys. I've been lucky enough to be to, to get to know or at least play music for a lot of folks within the, the restaurant industry. And one thing I do know is, is, Dave, what you said is accurate, that it's a little bit of creativity, but it's a lot of making sure that the ledgers run on time, that ledgers don't run on time, but you know what I mean, that the ledgers line up, that everything's are clean, that people are being well paid. But Fred, you must be able to take a moment, I hope, when you know the prime minister and the president eat dinner at your restaurant to go like, wow, we really created something special here. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I wasn't there that night. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's cool how we, you didn't feel that you had to. Yeah. We, we Over the course of the years, we had to, uh, we, we cooked for a lot of people, you know, whether yeah. it's in our other life or now. 
And um, I'm always amazed on how we can manage or we, we have that appeal somehow. It's a little restaurant with like old, dirty pine wood painted floors, uh, French food, and then the Rolling Stones would want to eat there. Yeah. Hacked and behave perfectly, maybe speak French with a few staff member, or even guys like most most recently, I was blown away. We had Post Malone show up, mm-hmm. you know, such a kind, and and he was like, uh, man, usually I have lemon drops, but educate me, mm-hmm. and like He's getting into wine, and he getting wants to into know. wine, right, having foie gras, yeah. having like you know sweet breads and stuff, mm-hmm. and I'm just amazed at how people would go out of their way and adapt and adopt the Joe Beef little thing that it is, you know? Mm. And in a way, like David said, it's great. I wasn't there when the Rolling Stones were there. It's awesome. We've always had this like work relationship where we don't have to be all hands on deck all the time. You right, know? right. We always knew where to draw the line at micromanaging, mm-hmm. you know. But, I, but I'm happy you get time. I'm happy you get time to, to realize that you've built something pretty special. Uh, of course. We worked 120 hours a week. We worked during Grand Prix. We worked... We were crazy hours. We destroyed our lives for mm-hmm. 20 years. We were like the, like sad sacks. Like we had everything and we just weren't happy. And uh, working wasn't making it, you know. So we were able now to take that time. David just bought a farm. I have my kids. I coach their hockey teams. I, I love it. I have a little workshop near my house. It's it's. It's getting to be the perfect life. I love it. Well, that I, took a long time, though. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I, I, and I do want to talk about that balance because Dave, any any uh, Q listener would know that you were the first person we called after Anthony Bourdain died. You were kind enough to come on our show and talk about it. DM was actually the person who called you, uh, the producer we had. She was the person who called you early in the morning and, and told you the news. I don't want you to talk too much about this because I know he was your buddy, but I'm just wondering how you're holding up. The book is uh, dedicated to him. Yeah, it's dedicated to him as well as our friend John Bill. So, you know, we had a rough beginning of the year. Uh, you know, John Bill passed, uh, who was a big part of our family. And uh, then Tony, soon after, who championed us for so many years, for almost a decade. You know, we have, Fred and I owe so much of what we have, uh, you know, the, the popularity of our restaurants, uh to Tony's endorsements, it, it, let's be clear that, you know, we're both very good cooks and these are small little restaurants in, in Little Burgundy, but there's nothing that we could have done to have an international reputation that Tony gave us. You, you know, know, we went to his, uh, his memorial a few months ago in New York. And it was at a restaurant, right? China, uh, a Chinese yeah. buffet. The Golden Unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just standing there, you know, uh, David Simon was there, Christian Amanpour, like like the people that were there and just like, hey, feel, feel that we were considered close friends enough with Tony that he considered us enough to attend that service. And then on, in the cab on the way back, we started thinking of everything, making a kind of a gratitude list of the Bourdain uh, he, sequels, you know, the, the, the consequences, the, the positive effect that he had on us and our lives and our restaurant, our business, our book, like starting with the publisher, the agency, like everything. He gave us a chance. He didn't lie about anything. You know, we wrote the book and everything, but he was such a a strong proponent in what he did for us. He did for David Chang, he did for Peter Meehan from Lucky Peach. He did for like countless other chefs that he saw through the grit that the medias weren't paying attention to these guys who were doing like an honest, real job. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden you got like people traveling 5,000 miles to go and eat somewhere. Right. And it's not the the notoriety or the fame that's important in that. It's just that those people had all of a sudden enough income to maintain that that little business of, you know, like like um, our friends in Newfoundland, you know? It's it's great they were on there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was it's huge great. for us. That we, it was huge for us to get Tony to come to Newfoundland. Mm-hmm. You know? I remember when he was on the show, I was telling him, you need to come to Newfoundland. You need to make sure you go out there. And, and I never did get my temper. Tony has well one. corrected a lot of like, we're not educated, Fred or I. You know, we've been in restaurants since a very young age. We got good at the craft that we practice, but education is something that we don't have. Uh, so inherent to not having education, there's behaviors, uh, thug-like mentality, uh, 
insensitivity that we had as young cooks right. that ultimately spending time with Tony early on and the way that he carried himself and he conducted himself, for us to be in that pirate ship so long with him as the captain, he demanded definitely that we carry ourselves and act a certain way, right. you know, and that was to be kinder, to be gentler, to be a better friend to the cooks that work inside the restaurants, uh, to make intelligent decisions. You know, there was a, there was a, in his intimate circle, there was a way of conducting yourself that he expected. If you feel that if you didn't conduct yourself, if you were even remotely ignorant or whatsoever, that you'd be shunned pretty quickly. You, you do talk about that in the book, and you talk about the necessity to take pictures with people, to be kind to people. And, and, and when every time I've gone to your restaurant, Dave, you're generally outside talking to people as they come out and, and go in. But you bring up a really interesting point, which is that uh, another thing that Anthony Bourdain did was through Kitchen Confidential, sort of glamorize, and he admitted this to me, you know, sort of glamorize that cutthroat nastiness that can happen. I think he also had a certain guilt about that that we discussed later, that he kind of glorified this this myth and this lifestyle, Mm -hmm. this rock and roll lifestyle. But he was, uh, I don't want to say guilt-ridden, but we heard an interesting anecdote from uh, David Simon that, you know, after uh, one of the food writer, uh, I think it was Alan Richmond, that Mm -hmm. that said something about uh, New Orleans after Katrina, and Bourdain said something not not kind of like he was pretty straightforward to him after and uh, when he had a, a writer's position on Treme he actually devised a way to reintroduce Richmond in like people's conscience and 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 in the media and to make amend on he gave him a, a way to make amend on what he had said before you mm-hmm. know through writing the the little part for him where actually the chef throws a, a sazerac in his face mm-hmm. And there was like countless little stories like that where he, what he did or said that he he was like mulling over, he tried later on to do right with. Yeah, he'd take the piss yeah. out of you, but he would eventually try and fix it somehow because he did feel, you know, even if he took you down on social media or something mm-hmm. like that, but he would definitely try to mend that bridge later on. Well, yeah, and what he said to me was, you know, I I feel a great guilt and I have a realization that I may have enabled a lot of meatheads in this industry. And that's, never, <laughs> that's never been my in, in, intention. But, you know, since Anthony has died or just in recent years, have you seen restaurant and kitchen culture change? It's changing now. A lot of people are working hard at it, you know, for our for on, on our side. Uh, We've always kind of been under, you know, that Tony spectrum somehow. And um, even more now with kids. Yeah. The kids have softened us up enormously. And of course, you know, like I've, I've been public about my battles with addiction and alcoholism and Fred's sober. I'm sober now. And I find that even inside of our restaurants, the fact that we didn't really realize, you know, after all these years, there's a hundred kids working in the kitchen, but like I'm sitting at the top of the pyramid with Fred in those restaurants. Yeah. And if I'm acting like a Viking all the time, drinking wine out of Magnums, carrying on at the bar across the street, at restaurants all over the city, in Newfoundland, Mm -hmm. in in Toronto. It it, it gives a certain permission to all these young cooks that work for us and apprentices that work for us and people in the dining rooms that work for us that if the the, the, the captain of the ship is a Viking warrior drinking wine, by default they are too. Right. The fact is, is when I sobered up and after rehab and I, we, I started working again and then Fred joined me soon after, uh, we noticed this amazing thing happen within the restaurant. It's like we change, we're starting to change the culture of the restaurant. I learned in rehab how to speak about my feelings, how to be the how to worry about other people's mental sanity, how to look at my staff and see, hang on, is this guy happy? Is he coming to work happy or is he coming to work hungover? Is he struggling with his girlfriend? Does he need to take time off? It's just, as I sobered up and did rehabilitation and therapy, the language that I learned is, and the language that Fred's learned has been transmuted into the work, workday culture of the restaurant. I'm very worried and take a daily pulse of more or less everyone that and works inside Im- the company. Yeah. It's important to step back to and, and take a good look at what you're 
you're fighting for? You know, are you fighting for stars? Are you fighting for like seven minutes delay on a main course? Mm -hmm. You know, and realize that that we're not curing cancer running a restaurant. No, no it's I a very yeah. futile uh, quest in a way. You know, and and I I look uh, on social media. You see recently videos of like a notorious tree star Michelin chef just making this little skit and pushing all his waiters until they fall down and stuff. And I find it extremely demeaning, you know, or like another one just plucking a hundred birds with like 15 staff wearing masks in a basement. And I'm like, okay, it's time we just reconsider all this, all those necessities, what's needed to create those, those empires and monstrous, like, star rated restaurants and like we talked often maybe go back to a simpler today we're having duck and 150 customers will have duck and mm -hmm. the pastry chef will do one cake mm -hmm. like three times to feed all those people and then everybody will be happy there's an art to the menu of the day restaurant yeah. why still have to why do i why do we have to have 15 appetizers and 12 main courses and have all the proteins under the sun why can't we go silent... back to a simpler time and say tonight the menu is super salad yeah. <laughs> it's a fish or duck and it's cheese or dessert mm -hmm. and be on your way. Well, it's one of the things you talk about in the book is that the one of the ends of the world we're facing is brought us on by um, a focus on the self. It's brought on by Instagram. There's a lot to be made about people taking pictures of food and stuff like that. And I'm not as interested in that. But do you think that social media or just have you noticed a big change in the expectations of diners, as you were just mentioning? Yeah, because a lot, some diners, not all, some, some are just like notching restaurants off the bucket list. Yeah, oh, I'm going to Toronto, I have to eat it. What's hot? What are the top five restaurants right now this year right. or this month or this quarter in Toronto? And then that's what they eat at. Then it's the same thing in Montreal. And it's the same thing in Los Angeles, the same thing in Toronto, but then we're kind of like, then we're forgetting these institutions. Uh, that have been open forever. Today, I walked by a restaurant with Fred. I'd never heard of it in my life. I walked by a restaurant called The Senator. Yeah, Senator Room. Little Diner. Absolutely right, stunning. Right by Rogers. Gorgeous mm -hmm. restaurant. Beautiful. I took a picture of it. Uh, we don't know it either. We live here. And I don't, know. Don't know. Just, it should, that's where Elton John was when he came last time. Elton apparently. John said it was a great yeah. burger. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we're fighting a battle in, a, you know, in Instagram. Not Instagram, but... The food that we do inside of Montreal or inside of our neighborhood has to be, it can't be, it has to be of that neighborhood, of that street, of that building. It has to work with the market that's near us. It has to be inspired by our French culture. I want people to come to that restaurant and to feel that they're eating in a French restaurant in the neighbor in the neighborhood of Little Burgundy in Montreal, the correct time, place, and history that it's in, as opposed to doing, you know, some Asian fusion in that restaurant. Right. You know? But I get yeah. what you say about the, your point about the, the cell phones themselves. It probably happened the same way in music where it, the cell phones and the online music and, and the downloads changed the way that people write albums, you know? Now it That's changed, it well, changed yeah. the perspective that people create a dish or not create, but th that people think of a dish. So... They'll reverse engineer from the way it looks from the top. Right. Right. So right. all of a sudden, and you're never like, unless you're super tall and standing over the table, you'll never see your food the way you take <laughs> yeah. a picture you'll of your food. You'll never see that latte art on the top. I no, understand. No. So yeah. we make simple food that's not meant to be photographed from above, but there's a lot of places that, like, like a lot of designers will design a wall that is meant to be photographed full face on, mm -hmm. you know? Um, maybe we're missing that little step. Of mm -hmm. course, we have the bison head in the bathroom for like, Insta it's not for Instagram purpose, but like mm -hmm. use it for that. But we're from the school where we loved words of menus, mm -hmm. you know? There's, and that's what we talk about. There's the a really great part of this book about the, the lost art of writing menus. It's one of my yeah, and, and you know, th there's some songs you listen to and they're like, is it written last year? Is it written 50 years ago? Is it Towns Van Zandt or a guy last year? Or is it like an old, old song? Mm -hmm. Because it's so beautifully written and rhythmic and, and, and everybody has his own way. And David and I always had a very simple way to describe food that was very French oriented. And when we traveled, we loved to go and steal menu in New York City and Boston. And then somebody would bring us another menu or go steal a picture from the menu case outside of a French restaurant in New York. And then you'd have no picture. You'd say, what could he have done with like 
black olives, uh, raisins, and currant. How, how was it, you know? Mm -hmm. And you know, it's traditional, so you can't, you know? Now you're like, okay, what is that foam, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and might be good, might, might not be. I know my mind works from words to food and not from image to Well, what food. I would do is I would just read the menu and then I would go on Yelp, try and find a picture of it. Yeah. And then say, okay, that, that's what it's going to be. That's oh. it's like music now, though. You can go on, you can listen to a song, and you can literally Google the chords, mm -hmm. and you know the chords in a second. There's 20 websites that will give you every chords to every song. You're right. Before, you had to kind of, that didn't exist. You had to really sit there with the guitar and scratch away until you figured out the chords. And ultimately, you become a better musician by doing that. That's what I tell people all the time. Speaking of music, by the way, uh, I love that you're the second chef interview I've had this year that has referenced The Grateful Dead in their book. Who's the <laughs> other one? Matty Matheson talked about The Grateful Dead in who, his book. Who is he? Matty. <laughs> of course. We love Matty. <laughs> He's a great guy. There's a, there's, I, 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 I'm starting to make a connection. I love The Grateful Dead, too. I'm starting to make a connection between chef culture and The Grateful Dead. I saw a lot of shows when I was a kid, uh, you know, kind of like different periods of hiatus and working in kitchens or just trying to find myself. The Dead was something that I did a couple of summer tours and... Uh, Fred talks a bit about – Fred never saw a show, but I talked a lot about you're much the, hosp older than me. <laughs> the, the hospitality of – If you're listening to this on the radio, much, much older. I apologize. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> the, the hospitality of a Grateful Dead parking lot. Yeah. Right? Uh, you could have drank too much or taken too much LSD, but you're always in a safe place. Mm -hmm. um, you That's know, pure empathy. Yeah. It was a very kind and you know, the big sign of are you kind um, – it was, a, it was a kind and safe place to be at the Grateful Dead shows on summer tour, even in, surrounded by 40,000, 50,000 people at Foxborough, Massachusetts in the hot sun. Everybody would make sure that you're hydrated. Uh, it was a safe place to bring your children. Uh, it was surrounded by, with kind, gentle people that were there to celebrate music and each other. And it, they would uh, share their sound, right? Mm -hmm. They'd let you tape. Mm -hmm. They did a lot of things. To, yeah, exactly. The taper section, uh, to have access to the show you just listened to 20 minutes later in the parking lot, it never left me. I said, when people came to the restaurant, or we got into the restaurant, when Fred and I were div uh, had no more bosses and we were allowed to practice the restaurant business the way that Fred and I wanted to practice the restaurant business, I'd bring you a blanket if you were cold. Mm -hmm. It'd take you home in my car if you drank too much. You're here, we're gonna feed you, we're gonna give you wine, but we're also gonna take care of you. You're in a safe place. And you're part of a community. Absolutely. You, everyone is here. The one thing I, I, I will say about going to your restaurants is that uh, you do feel like you're kind of on the same page as everybody else in the restaurant. You're you wanna not... get to a first name basis as quick as possible with the people. There's yeah. no sir, right. everybody's equal. Even no. though I had, a, I had a lovely Newfoundlander serve me last time. <laughs> Andy. Was, yeah, he was a nice fellow. Yeah, no, he's an awesome guy. Um, Jerry Garcia, too, is a great uh, role model. Short, pudgy guy for a short, pudgy cook we wear. <laughs> or me, at least. Um, when people put away this book, when they, when they close it, you know, what discernible changes do you want them to make in how they think about food and how they cook food when they, after, after they read the Joe Beef Surviving the Apocalypse? Oh, they have to come to the restaurant, come to Montreal, and mm -hmm. they can try their own restaurant in their area. You know, and, and maybe um, plant a little garden, make a little first aid kit, take their kids fishing, you know, find their own secret lake, uh, make too much great food on a Sunday night at home, mm -hmm. um, read every page of it, do none of the recipes. For me, is the best compliment. <laughs> I love that the book is at cottages that I rent sometimes. It's in the bathroom. The books, the pages are dog-eared. And uh, people say, like, I read it all the time, but I, I don't make that food, you mm. know? Oh, it's the best compliment. I've seen so many pictures of the Joby for our first book just on Instagram, completely dog-eared, really well-read. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate compliment that it's picked up again and again and again. Oh, it's, it's, it's a tremendous book. Like I said to you, I, I was going to read about a quarter of it last night and kind of leave the rest of the imagination today, but I could not help myself. I ended up reading the entire thing. I don't know. I think I'm going to be able to make a little bit of it. I was only joking around about my inability to cook, but I, I made my first Thanksgiving dinner this year, by the way. Awesome. What did you make? I made a turkey, uh, salt meat, like Newfoundland salt meat, carrot, turnip. But that's like every day in Newfoundland. Peas pudding. Turkey did you go stuffing. Home? Yeah. Did, did you do that here? You no, home? I did it here. But my mom brought up turnip because they only have rutabaga in Ontario. Mm. Yeah, pretty smart. Hey. They have turnip good. recipes in there. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming in, Buzz. Thank you so Thank much, Thank you so Tom. much.